Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Guess what we're going to do today? A little bit of a special. We're going to title it, Strong Delusion. And do you know what? Our Father, the God of love, is the one that sends this strong delusion upon certain people. Exactly what does that mean? Well, it means that they don't have eyes to see or ears to hear, and they're kind of just in a stupor, or he kind of puts them to sleep, and they'll believe most anything anyone tells them. Well, why would God do that? Well, that's why we're going to do this special, so that you know what it is that really angers our Father, or I think probably disappoints Him would be a better word, to the point that He would send strong delusion upon a people that would act and react to Him and His Word in the way that they do. Now that's the question. Why would He do it? We'll answer it in these set of two lectures on this subject. I think probably the best place to start is a chapter that most of you are very familiar with, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want to take you to the setting of the time that Paul wrote this. He wrote it very, very soon after 1 Thessalonians, his first letter to the Thessalonians. As a matter of fact, Paul and Silvanus were still there. They had not left, they had not departed the area before he penned this second letter and sent to them because they hadn't understood the first letter. And what did the first letter, what was the main topic, the same as the second, the return of Jesus Christ in the second advent? People got all shook up and misunderstood. So in this second Thessalonians and chapter two, he explains why he writes this second letter, but at the same time, your, an your question is answered there as to why our Father would send strong delusion upon a people. So, with the word of wisdom from our Father, we ask that in prayer, that in the name of Yeshua, let's get into it with, those, with that question in mind. Why would a loving God send strong delusion upon people that really thought they wanted to follow Him? Chapter 2, verse 1, 2 Thessalonians, and it reads, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now the Greek is very, uh, well, I'm going to say strict in as, in as much as uh, the um, being specific, all right? Here you have the subject is the return of Jesus Christ. He says, I want to talk to you. In other words, that's what this subject is about, this particular chapter, this setting, and our gathering back to Him. Now that's what many people say. You're just gonna be ready and with a bolt of lightning and a hoof of wind, away you go. Well, let's see if that's what Paul says. Ignorance is bliss, I suppose, at times, and maybe I can understand why God would send stupor or strong delusion on some people. Because God makes things so specific and so clear in His Word. And how they come up with some of their dreams, well, it's just understandable. Delusion might be a kindness to them. Verse 2 that you be not soon shaken in mind. And he says, I want to talk to you very seriously and I don't want you to be confused in your mind or be troubled neither by spirit, that's to say some spirit that might come along. It's not the Holy Spirit. You notice it's the lower case. It's some man spirit or some other dude, all right? Spirit. Nor by word, that's to say traditions, men, 
talking, nor by letter as from us. Don't even let that first letter, the first Thessalonians uh, letter, don't let that uh, confuse you as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't let it confuse you concerning Christ returning and our gathering back together with him. What he's going to do is lay forth a set of events that must come to pass before we gather back. I don't care what you want to call it. If you want to call it flyaway, butterfly stories, all right with me. Hey, we can still be friends. If you must use a word that's not biblical, rapture, go ahead if it makes you feel better. That, but whatever, by whatever means, our gathering back to Christ, that's important. These events, he said, don't let some preacher, some church, some church system, or even our first letter confuse you about our gathering back to Christ. Verse 3, listen carefully. Let no man deceive you by any means. That means by letter, spirit, church, traditions, by no means, for that day shall not come. Now here you have an absolute, shall not come except unless before. In other words, he's telling you these events must come to pass, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, this isn't complicated because there's only one of those. There's only one entity named, and that is Satan himself, that has been promised he will go into perdition. Well, what does perdition mean? Well, it's, it means to perish. He's already been judged. He is only allowed to do what he does to prove and test the children. And then he's going to die. He's going into the lake of fire, if that suits you better. There's only one son of perdition. Don't ever let anyone confuse you on that issue. But what is this falling away? It, a falling away, the word is apostasy. It means someone having a focused belief on Messiah, on Jesus, and all of a sudden turning and following a false Jesus. He says that must come to pass before the true Christ returns to this earth. And we, we who? We believers, Christians, gather back to him. This event will come to pass. Now he goes into more detail. Verse 4, the son of perdition, Satan appearing to be Jesus. That's what it means. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself. Do you know what that means? He puts himself in charge. He claims to be the head guru, the head savior. Above all that is called God, well, Christ is the son of God, Yeshua, from which the word Jesus comes means God's savior or Yeshua's savior. So certainly that's called God. In other words, he's putting himself above Christ and even above God himself. Above all that is called God or that is worshiped. This, this refers to even other beliefs aside from Christianity. He puts himself above all. We could say of Islam, Buddha, and on and on. So that he as God, do you, do you understand what that means? He as God. That means he in the place of God sitteth in the temple of God. Now, where is the temple of God? Isn't that complicated? A child can tell you. Mount Zion, that's where it was built. God made a covenant with it in the 16th chapter of, uh, the 16th chapter of Ezekiel. He says, it's my permanent home always my favorite spot on earth. It always shall be. That's where the temple sits, showing himself that he is God and showing the world that he's God. He's supernatural. He's coming as that one we know, the spurious Messiah, or instead of Christ, I like to call him. And many people that do not study God's word, it's not difficult to speak to God or talk to God or hear God talk 
because that's what the Word is, is His words to you, forewarning you exactly what shall take place in a very specific way. Why would you want to listen to man and be confused? Well, what has been said so far? That before we gather back to Christ, that the son of perdition, the spurious Messiah, must appear on this earth, on Mount Zion, in God's own church, claiming to be Christ, claiming to be Savior, Yeshua, and even placing himself, if you would, above God in the importance and the minds of people. Well, I, I know many say, well, I've never heard that before. Well, you should have because it's very plain, and this is only one of the places it's written in God's Word. It's written in many places. You're beginning to maybe get a little hint of why God might send stupor and delusion upon some people that cannot listen to something written on a level that a child can understand. Wake up. Verse 5, Paul continues, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. I went much farther into detail. I told you about them. I reminded you. And here he's, he must write this letter because the first letter and men confused them. Are you confused today or are you a student of God's Word? Or perhaps you're not biblically illiterate, are you? I would trust not because your own creator, your own father wrote this letter to you. I hope you understand it. Verse 6, and now you know, in other words, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and only he who letteth, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now many so-called scholars, they're not, say, this is talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, it isn't. The verb in this seventh verse is a transitive verb. It's very simple. It means that the subject and object, in as much as one is not named in this in six and seven, that it leans back to or transfers to the subject and object being discussed. Well, what was that? I don't want to go through it again. Some would think I was talking down to them. Some perhaps think I am already, be that as it may. In other words, who is the subject? Well, the subject is the false Messiah sitting in the seat of God claiming to be Savior. <clears throat> and where is he now? What would, in other words, you must always use this gray matter. Where is he now according to God's Word, not some tradition or some man? Well, Revelation 12, 7 makes it very clear that he is in heaven doesn't mean that he's overcome by any means. He's in chains there, if that makes you feel better. Michael guards him day and night. But Michael's going to cast him out on this earth, and that's when he comes, the son of perdition, and sets himself up. That's why it's written in Revelation chapter 12, Boy, rejoice and feel good up here in heaven. We're going to have a party. Him and his bad angels are gone. Michael cast them down to earth. This has not happened yet, friend. His spirit and the evil spirits have access to uh, as the prince of the air, air, pneuma, spirit, but not de facto as spurious Messiah or son of perdition. But he's coming. And then it is written in Revelation 12, woe, woe, woe to you on earth. For he is cast down unto you, and he knows he has but a short time. And that's when he sits on Mount Zion, claiming to be Messiah. Now, what does this seventh verse work then? How does, what does it really mean? For the mystery 
of the lawlessness, iniquity, doth already work. It's down there and it's already working. If you're familiar with the Kenites, you don't have to look very far to see it, which is a Hebrew word that simply means the sons of Cain. Mentioned many times in the good old King James Version. Only he who now letteth will let. Well, who is it that is allowing Satan to do certain things? Michael is placed in charge under God until he be taken out of the way, until Michael cast him out to this earth, takes him out of heaven and puts him down here. That's when it happens. Now, there's nothing really difficult if you understand a transitive verb about that. Paul has put this on a level that, again, and I, I, I'm not talking down to you, but a child can understand it, the simplicity in which God's Word is taught to His children, you, is written whereby anyone can understand it if you teach it rather than traditions of men and allow confusion of mind to enter in. Simply follow the Word. Now, verse 8. What happens when Michael lets, that is to say, cast him out? Verse 8. And then, when? And then, then what? The subject, the spurious Messiah standing in Jerusalem, the holy place, Mount Zion. And then shall that wicked be revealed. That means made known. You will see him. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What is the spirit of the Lord? It's his tongue. What is his tongue? As it is written in Revelation 1.16, his word, that's what comes out of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Whose coming? His coming, meaning the words of Christ. The subject being from verse 1, when and how we gather back to the true Christ. When the true Christ does return, after the son of perdition, has set up office in the temple of God, so-called, then and only after that will you see the true Christ return. We just covered that in the 13th chapter of Mark where we had two tribulations. The first tribulation being the appearance of the, of the false Christ on this earth and the second tribulation being the coming of the true Messiah. Now that's not difficult, all right? Not difficult at all. Anyone should be able to understand that unless they've been blinded. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power. Now that, that's not just a little old man's power. That's supernatural power and signs and lying wonders, performing miracles, claiming to be Yeshua, claiming to be Jesus. And many people that are not spiritually prepared will believe it is, come to rapture them away, ready to take their little ride. And that's exactly what he will tell them. And he will add a little addition in as much as he will say, Let's convert with a great revival. Jesus saying, let's have the greatest revival the world's ever known. That's when these deceived ones will begin to deliver their brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. They'll say, they're really good people. Go save them. There's just one problem. It's Satan they're talking to. They've actually, the falling away, to be very blunt and perhaps a little unfair, but not necessarily, they turn from Christ worshipers to Satan worshipers because they worship him as Christ sitting in the temple of God because it all sounds so biblical. Not if you've read God's word, it doesn't. It's very biblical, all right, because he has foretold us exactly how it will come to pass. Therefore, there is no need for you to be deceived. Well, why does it say he's working after Satan if it is Satan? because it's one of his offices as false Christ. 
All right. He goes by many names. Have you ever read them? I was quoting from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 a moment ago, where there he's called the old dragon, the devil, which is to say Satan, the serpent. He was the serpent in the garden. Still, it's all Satan or Lucifer. Same entity, lots of names to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. But you're sharper than that. All right. Now, Verse 10, he's going to perform miracles and tell a lot of lies. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. That's an interesting word, perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth. Perish means to burn hell, all right? That's where you perish at, the soul. But because they received not the love of the truth, they didn't learn to love this word, to understand what our Father had said to us, that they might be saved. They wouldn't listen to the salvation message. Oh, well, brother, you don't understand. The salvation message is taught all over the world. Yeah, but what is, this, what is said? All you've got to do is believe. You don't have to understand the word because you're going to be gone. Oh, yeah, you'll be gone, all right. That's the falling away. Be careful, my friend. I beseech you about the returning of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you be not deceived. Because it's not going to happen the way some man says it's going to happen. It's going to happen exactly as it's written. Have you ever read... He's going to deceive them because they don't go into the word past the milk. Verse 11, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. There's our title. There's our question. For this cause, God shall send them, not maybe, not perhaps, shall send. Who will do this? Yahweh, our Father, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So, why does God send strong delusion? Because people that will not get into His Word, understand His Word, will ultimately be deceived by following after the lying fables of Satan. Well, now, just a minute, you said those that think they're going to be raptured out. Well, who do you think implanted all of these thoughts? The little lady that brought forth even the word rapture in the year 1830 said it felt very cold and negative and satanic when she first had the vision. But then the preachers thought it sounded wonderful. Even though it's not in God's word. It happened to come from the first letter of Thessalonians, and that's why he hastily wrote this second, so you would have an actual account of how, in, in the simplest way that, and Paul was an expert teacher, put forth in a way by a teacher that knew how to tell us what would happen and how we would gather back to Christ. Now, you have, you have a problem if you don't agree with Paul and many other writers in the Word because they, it all basically is stated in this same wise. You have a problem if you don't believe that. And that makes the falling away come all the easier to some. But why would God send the strong delusion? It's real simple. If someone will not study His Word, He's going to make sure that they're deceived because he doesn't want them. Sound hard? He doesn't want them to come into a knowledge that they would not be able to stand up to the task of standing against Satan as an entity, spurious Messiah on this earth. There are more reasons than one why he would do that, and at the risk of confusing the issue, I'm going to give at least one, is that 
it falls on the unforgivable sin that if one of God's elect that do have eyes to see and that God does not send a strong delusion but sees and understands the truth perfectly, that if they bow to this spurious Messiah, it's the unforgivable sin. Otherwise, they're taught. God will not send these to hell that are deceived at this time. If they wake up to the truth, because when the true Christ sets foot on this earth, every knee shall bow to him, even the Kenites, on the first day, before the entire period is through, many will fall away again. Those will go to hell. Now, well, is that said again? Don't forget the subject matter. Why would a loving God send a strong delusion? Because they won't pay attention to him. There, are, there comes a time, and you can put it on this wise if you like. There comes a time when every parent, after having repeated themselves over and over and over and over again, if they do not, example, I'll give any, let's say, that stove is hot, child, don't touch it, over and over and over again, and sooner or later, um, then what are you going to do? Let him touch it. They're going to get burned. So our Father, after so many warnings, pleadings, he never begs anyone to receive him. But after those warnings, if they still choose to follow man and his ways and his church, that, that is to say the traditions that form a church system that is contrary to the word of God as far as our gathering back to Christ, then let them be deceived. Let them learn that they must listen to him, our Father God, rather than men or they're going to be deceived, all right? Now, let's go to Romans chapter 11 for a moment, and let, let's pick up on this again. Would God send a spirit of, of, of um, stupor or slumber or confusion or even delusion? You bet he would. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, Paul speaking again, Hath God cast away his people, meaning Israel? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul was a Benjamite, all right? Let there be no doubt about that. Uh, he was a Roman by natural birth because his father had Roman citizenship, but he, he was not by seed Roman. You got it? Verse 2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Would ye not that what the scriptures say of Elias, let's just say old Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, verse 3, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, old Jezebel butchered a bunch of them, remember, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone and they seek my life, they want to kill me now, and Jezebel was on his case hard. So it would seem that God's word was all over with. But what does God say to him? Verse 4, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men, there's no gender in that, who, shall not, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal, that means to be confused, to worship the spurious Messiah or the ways of men or anyone else. It's called God's elect. Verse 5, even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election. I repeat, election, God's elect, election of grace, meaning all down through the years there have been those that were teachers and knew the actual understood basically the primary principles of God's word. Verse six, election of grace, and if by grace, verse in this six, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. 
But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. That's very confusing if you do not know those that have that are of God's elect and those that have free will. God's election were chosen as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, before the foundations of this earth age. Before the foundations, the katibu in the Greek, the overthrow of Satan. And those with free will, by grace, yes. Unmerited favor, yes. Does that mean that God's election are perfect? No, they sin and fall short. And by grace, their sins are forgiven. Verse 7, what then? What can we say about these things? That everybody turned on God. That we have this method of salvation and election. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. They couldn't cut it by the law or otherwise. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. And there you have it. Verse 8, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And I say even unto this day. Once you see God's election, his real plan, and you try to share that with others, God has seared over their eyes to the point, if they have not listened, to a point that it's impossible for them to see the truth. So who sent this slumber? The word in the Greek is an interesting word. Check it out. It means stupor. And I tell you this, if you go to a large commercial place of this time, let's pick an airport. Watch the people. Do they know really what tomorrow brings or are they just floating from one day to the other, most of them from paycheck to paycheck or deal to deal? Making a deal here and have to make another one before they can live tomorrow. They're in a stupor. They don't know what God is doing. They don't even know if God is real. It's a fascinating thing. Yes, God will send strong delusion. Yes, God will send the spirit of slumber. Why? Because the children ask for it. They love to be deceived in certain aspects. Paul would mention this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that the super preachers, he says there, will pass out all kinds of things and you swallow it hook, line, and sinker, which is what the Greek is stated in the Greek. It means that you receive it well. You like to hear it. Some quick fix, some easy way out when there is only one truly easy way out, my friend, and that's our Father's way in love, knowledge, wisdom, His wisdom, and keep the wisdom of this world outside of the parameters of the true story of salvation and election and what God's servants must do in their work, and yes, their sins are forgiven by grace, when they repent, that is. But the election, God's children have work to do. It certainly doesn't include a falling away. They cannot be deceived because the spirit of deception is not upon them. I trust it isn't upon you. Yes, God sends strong delusion. It says here, according as it is written. We'll pick up that thought again. You see, this isn't only a New Testament teaching. The next lecture, you're going to hear the same thing from the old. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, please. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. 
It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. All right, bless your hearts, there we are back again. Hey, let's have the old 800 number on the screen there, if we may, 1-800-643-4645. That 800 number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., including Alaska and Hawaii, and all over the North Country, Canada. So if the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Won't you do that? Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need a telephone number, you don't need an address. He's your father, talk to him. That's one of the quickest ways to come out from under delusion. That is to say, to being biblically illiterate and not understanding our Father's Word is to talk to Him, tell Him you love Him, and pray for wisdom and the ability to understand His Word and stop being biblically illiterate. Talk to Him. He's your Father, your nearest of kin. Father, we love you. We come to you around the world at this time, and we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, prosper, heal in Yeshua's precious name. All right, let's get into some questions and see what's on the minds of people around the country. Let's go to Holly from West Virginia. I know that when someone dies, they go to heaven on one side of the gulf or the other. That's exactly correct. My question is, will we know each other? Will we recognize our loved ones? Absolutely. Ezekiel 44, which covers the millennium age. It's amazing how often we get that question. It's a good question, dear. It documents there that one of God's election, that's to say the priest of the Zadok, a Hebrew word that means the just, are able to go to their loved ones if it is a blood relative, mother, brother, father, sister, uh, so forth, uh, wife, husband, and help them. Uh, at a little price. It's all covered there in Ezekiel 44. Kathleen from, Catherine from Delaware. I was talking to a friend and I said I wanted to be cremated. She told me this was a sin. Is it a sin? Question. Does it talk about it in the Bible? If it does, where? Well, Catherine, tell her to show you where it says in the Bible that it's a sin to be cremated. Don't, don't let somebody get away with that kind of stuff. That's why we have so much illiteracy in the world today is people hear some old codger somewhere behind a wooden platform say make a statement like this that's absolutely a lie and, and then pass that on as gospel and it just she, she cannot show you in the word where it's a sin to be cremated. Now, I can tell you where you can look. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 states that ere the old silver cord parts, that means we die, all right? That the spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your soul, goes instantly to the Father that gave it. But this old flesh body goes back to dust from where it came. Cremation is just a quicker trip, all right? Gets you there a little quicker. No sin in it. And in these times, due to expensive, those on expenses, those on fixed incomes, don't ever let some church rob you with lies, all right? I don't apologize to anybody for making a statement concerning ignorance. She can't find it in God's Word that it's a sin because it isn't there, all right? Nellie from Virginia. Will we know our, our loved ones in the millennium? If so, where in the Bible can I document this? Just discussed. We get that a lot, don't we? Ezekiel 44. Julius from North Carolina. When Satan was in heaven, what kind of angel was he? Well, he wasn't an angel, um, Julius. He was a cherubim. And you can read what kind of cherubim he was by reading Ezekiel chapter 28. God made, he's, God was proud of him. He said, I made you the, the full pattern. Now, when you read that uh, 28th chapter of Ezekiel, you need to know these things, that the word Tyrus means rock, not our rock, their rock, Satan. The prince of Tyrus is Satan after he fell from the altar of God. 
The king of Tyrus, as written in Ezekiel 28, is Satan as a cherubim that God created. All right? Check it out for yourself. It also tells you what happens to him in the 18th verse. Georgia from, where is Georgia from? Oklahoma. Okay, I know you believe if someone kills people, then they need killed and sent on, and I do also, but here is what I saw on TV. Question, this guy killed about 20 people, and the last woman he got to kill, she was saved, and she got him born again. So he went to jail for his acts, but this preacher got on it, and he went to jail and baptized this man and preached to him. The state gave him death, and this preacher went down there with him when they killed him, and he said the man was born again and went to heaven. My question, did he pray, did he pay for his killings? Of course he did. It, it doesn't, there's nothing wrong with a murderer repenting, but he's still going to pay for it. That's biblical, very biblical. Deuteronomy chapter 19. He's not going to walk clean. There are no unsolved murders in heaven. I don't care how, what kind of lawyers a person could hire and get away from this or get away from that, but certainly he's going to pay the whole price and God will see to it that uh, he or she does, all right? So uh, there you have it. Now I would say uh, that would uh, fit all occasions where one were a murderer. Many would say, well, Jesus said you might be judged if you kill. No, he didn't. You need to check the Greek out a little bit. He said, if one is a criminal, commits criminal homicide, fonyance in the Greek, they're going to die. All right? Joan from Wisconsin, does the Bible tell us when the age of innocence ends for a child and when they will be judged on their own merit? Well, it, uh, Jan, it doesn't. It just the age of accountability is different for many people, all right? It's, uh, I've, I've seen children six years old and younger even that uh, in certain cases I feel were accountable. But usually the average is about 12, all right? I'll just say that. Pastor, concerning the continuance of the Adamic line after the flood, was the reproduction between the first cousins, would you please explain? Well, of course, when, the, uh, when, when the earth was pure, naturally if God created one man and one woman on the, uh, to tend the soil of the Adamic bloodline, Naturally, there was a mix. It was not incest. Well, why wasn't it? Well, let me ask you a question. When did, when did the law concerning incest come into being? Your question is answered. Naturally, there was closer relations at that time. Then, after they had replenished, then the law of incest came into being. No big deal. Liz from Texas. Mark 9.39 where Jesus told the disciples not to hinder those casting out demons in his name, how, how does that reconcile that with Matthew 7, through 25, where Jesus tells those who cast out demons to get away, he never knew them? Well, that, that's a good question because the ones of Mark 9, 39 were actually casting out demons in the name of Jesus, Yeshua. These that come to him in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, saying, when Christ returns to this earth at the end, oh, Jesus, we, can't, we had church in your name. We, we just tossed out demons in your name and everything and was ready to fly away. And then the spurious Messiah comes along and we cast out in his name. And Jesus said, you get out of my sight. I never knew you. You got it? In Matthew 7, they were casting them out in the rapture Jesus. I know that's a little cruel and it takes advantage of ignorance, but be that as it may, it's about time we've got right down where the rubber meets the road because we're almost at his return. The first Messiah that sits foot on this earth 
this is the spurious Messiah in the near future, and he's a fake. Many are going to worship him, and that's why it is written in both the old and the new that Christ shall become a stumbling block because they're going to believe this is Christ come to rapture them away. Wake up. It's, and I'm not, and Liz, I know you know better, but uh, that's to those that would still let that old delusion creep over them. I love all of our brethren, and it is for that reason that I teach. Am I very popular among the brethren? Well, I think you can probably figure that out real quick for yourself. I'm not exactly the most popular teacher in the world. However, I probably have more people listening to me than any other teacher in the world. And as much as we go around the world and we're in over 100 million homes in this hemisphere by television and radio. So be that as it may, um, I'm not out to win a popularity contest. And many people are going to be deceived and Christ is going to say, get out of my sight. I never knew you because they follow the spurious Messiah. Those in Mark we're casting out in the name of the true Messiah. Question on Revelation. This is Alfred from the Bahamas. Good to hear from you, Alfred. Question on Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Are they become him and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. Well, that, that has to do with the people spoken of in Revelation chapter 9 that have the seal of God in their forehead, which means in their mind they know the true lamb, they know what his blood paid for, they stay true to him, they do not fall away. And two of them, that is to say the two witnesses, will die in the streets of Jerusalem. But as far as the others are concerned in witnessing before this spurious Messiah, as Luke puts it probably better than anyone, when you are delivered up before the spurious Messiah, the synagogue of Satan, you're not to premeditate what you'll say, but the Holy Spirit will speak through you. And at that time, at that time, they cannot harm one hair on your head. All right, so reconcile it with that. But the two witnesses, and they're not going to complain about it, whoever they are. They're not going to complain about their lives taken when they're delivered up. Bert from Florida, um, I'm a new viewer to your teachings and let me tell you what a pleasure it is to listen to someone who teaches the word of our Father. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Could you please explain the correct genealogy of Jesus? The one indicated in St. Luke reveals that Heli was the father of Joseph and the one in St. Matthew says it was Jacob. Also, please explain why the genealogy in St. Luke doesn't correspond with the one in Genesis 11. In St. Luke, okay, it's real simple. The genealogy listed in Matthew, this, this is one of those little tricks, that, not trick, but things that our Father allows and he states very clearly what he's talking about at the conclusion of the genealogy and in one case, before he gives the genealogy, and that's the part you've got to watch. He states very clearly concerning the Matthew, the Matthew genealogy that this is not the genealogy of Christ, but it is the genealogy of Joseph who had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the conception of Yeshua Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God. He wasn't his father. So that genealogy in Matthew is, is kind of a, an adoption to wit, stepfather to son. Got it? Now, what about St. Luke? Why is it different? Because it's a different genealogy. It's the genealogy of Mary's father. Mary's father was of the tribe of Judah. Now, there is more to that genealogy. Elizabeth was a cousin to Mary. What was Elizabeth's genealogy? She was a full-blood Levite. Otherwise, she could not have been married to, 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 uh, to uh, her husband, who was a full-blood uh, Zacharias, who was a full-blood Levite. 
And it stipulates in the first chapter of Luke that she was of the daughters of Aaron. So also was Mary's mother. So Christ then was of both the priest line, the king line, and I do this for your question from Genesis 11, as well as the son of God. Sheila from Tennessee, fifth verse of chapter 20 in Revelation. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. It's, it's really very simple. Stop and think. When the millennium begins, what happens at the seventh trump? All bodies are changed in the wink, twinkle of an eye into spiritual bodies. But many, though they will be in a spiritual body, are still, their soul is liable to die, which means that's what uh, that word in the Greek is mortal, liable to die. If they don't get through judgment, they will die. So it means those that are spiritually dead after the first resurrection must remain spiritually dead until the end of the millennium when Satan is released a short season and they either make it or lose it on their own. Then will take place the second resurrection, but oh, whoa, whoa, whoa to those that fail. Because then also, as you'll read in the last verse of chapter 20, the second death takes place. A word to the wise is sufficient. Fear not those who can kill this body, but he that can both destroy this body and your soul cause it to perish. Jane from Florida, does God call a woman to preach if she is not married? I was under the impression if a woman was married and she could express the word better than her husband, only then was she allowed to preach the word. Well, I thought all women thought they could talk better than their husbands. Well, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding, all right? No, th this isn't true, all right? God always calls his teachers. Acts chapter 21, verse 9, I I'm going to punch a hole in whoever told you this little uh, bubble, okay? In, in Acts chapter 21, I think it's verse 9. Give me a little leeway there. Old Philip had four virgin daughters. Well, they certainly weren't married. And they were all four prophetess, which means teachers. Okay? All four of those ladies, unmarried and virgins, were prophetess. Right there in God's Word. Lana from Florida, you said something about good news of the message in the pyramid. I'm confused about it because I thought you said fallen angels built it, but don't but don't give them credit. I'm sorry, my dear. I, you, I was making sure when I stated that, don't give the bad angels credit for it because they didn't build it, okay? And, and apparently I didn't make that clear enough. I'm glad you caught it, and I'm glad that uh, you give me the opportunity to say, I know the bad angels did not build it because it is the Bible in stone, if you would. Vivian from Mass, is the word L pronounced L like an elephant or L like an hail? It's, it's L like an elephant. But it's also L like in Daniel because that's what it is. Daniel is God is my judge. L. L is my judge. Uh, let's take another one. Ezekiel. El. El is God's name. It means Ezekiel means God, uh, strong is my God, or it can be translated a little bit, my strength is God. My strength is El. Anytime, and if, uh, let's take Jeremiah, uh, a H, that's Yah. That's the really sacred name, meaning Jeremiah means in part, has in part God's name within it, as well as the L, and pronounced L. Um, Antoinette from Wisconsin. The woman with child, when Satan comes, will this be any woman? Uh, no, no, don't, you misunderstand. When I taught Mark 13, whereby it states, woe to those that are with child and that give suck when I return, that that's spiritual. Christ expects a virgin bride. 
and those Christians that fall off to the instead of Christ are impregnated with a mark in their mind, forehead, what's in your forehead? The gray matter, your brain. They are deceived because of the, delu of the delusion, all right? And they are impregnated with false religion. It's not an actual birth. Uh, that's a blessed event. Will the beast that protects Jesus' throne be the same beast that will overthrow Satan? No, it's a zone. No, it's Michael that overthrows him, all right? Revelation chapter 7, the zoe or zoon uh, do not accomplish that. Matthew from California, with the things the way they are now in the government and society, should a man or person join the army? Well, if I, if I wanted to, and um, for the benefit of a trade or something of that nature, because the army or uh, quite frankly, if I was a young man, I would do as I did in the beginning. I would join the Marine Corps, okay? Be that as it may. Our Navy, the Navy's a good branch of government. The Air Force, we've got a lot of good ones. Our country's not in that bad of shape. The liberals would just like for you to think it was, okay? Yeah, we have a lot of socialists, and that's what they are, liberal socialists, that would like to take over. They're not going to. We're not going to let them. Don't worry about them. Join if you choose. No problem, but it must be your choice. It's a great nation, and it needs good men and women to protect it. I'm out of time again. Hey, I love you all a whole big bunch, and you know why. That's not all that important. The important thing is that God loves you too. He loves you because you enjoy studying His Word more in depth. It really makes his day. Always remember that. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, it will change your life. Now, there's one thing that's more important, though, than anything else. And that is that you stay, I repeat, stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even though it has some bumps. Hey, good challenge. It's a good day because Christ is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.